shocks that happen to us are one not predictable. What you can expect is that they will happen again, but you don't know which one. Welcome to Transmission, the podcast of the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. This season, we invite you to join our researchers in their never-ending quest for a healthier world. In the previous episode, we took a look at the quality of our health systems, or the lack thereof. In this fourth and final episode, we unravel the question, what can we do when a crisis hits, and how can we prepare our health systems? Transmission, your front row seat to the world of health, science, and beyond. And now, leading scientists are concerned by the recent run of new climate records As being well, set. Israeli so Defense Forces struck at the, the, the Al Shifa Hospital. And doctors are raising an alarm over a surge in respiratory infections in the, in the country. Around the world, crises are putting people's health care under pressure. There are fast attacks like COVID and war, or slow, more insidious challenges like climate change, an aging population, or urbanization. What will be the next big shock that we need to prepare for? I think nobody can say. I mean, what will happen is, of course, that we will get shocks. We listen to Bruno Marshall, researcher at ITM. He is a quick thinker and a fast talker with grey hair, glasses, and a broad view of the world. But what kind of shocks? I mean, we never expected that COVID would hit the way it hit. Um, we never expected that the war in Ukraine actually had some kind of knock-on effects economically, socially, politically, all over the world. Things are getting more complex. As gas and energy suppliers around the world were threatened by the war in Ukraine, other houses of cars were toppled. Healthcare trembled. Countries like Pakistan, but also Sri Lanka, actually got far less fuel. And that immediately had an impact upon their economy because there was not enough fuel for the production of their factories, but also cars and mobility. We can't predict these shocks. Who would have thought a few years ago that Sri Lanka would be in trouble because of a war in Ukraine? Shocks that happen to us are one not predictable. What you can expect is that they will happen again, but you don't know which one. We'll have to have massive, massive, massive crises before we wake up. Eh? What kind of shock do we need to really wake up to the challenge of today? It's one of the many questions Bruno is working on. How can we put systems in place? How can we prepare for complex problems that we don't even know are coming? To answer that, we need to step into a car. Imagine you're driving a car on a road you've never been on before. You don't know if there are potholes, unexpected structures, or detours ahead. In this situation, you don't need a detailed map, a plan with every possible obstacle marked. What you need is a skilled driver and a well-maintained car with responsive brakes and steering. In other words, you need people and equipment with the capacity to respond quickly and effectively to any surprises you encounter along the way. Building capacity means making sure our systems are in place and our skills are sharp for individuals as well as for organizations and governments. It's about giving ourselves and the rest of society the ability to deal with the unexpected, to be flexible and adaptive, even if we don't know exactly what form the challenge will take. I heard some people talk about what we'll do now is prepare for 100 different kinds of crises so that we have a crisis, a crisis plan for each shock that will happen, which is nonsensical and a waste of energy because basically you don't know what will happen. Because what you see now is very much that we try to be prepared for the next COVID pandemic. From a crisis management perspective, that makes sense. But actually drawing a detailed plan is pretty pointless. We're nothing with a planned mega stock of face masks if the next disaster doesn't call for face masks. We're better off investing in an industry that can make other things besides masks. And preferably that industry is not on the other side of the world. Because we realized that all of the production was pulled back or kind of uh, pushed out of the European continent to China. Well, if the Chinese uh, factories are closed because of COVID, then suddenly you see kind of, again, knock-on effects on the production chains and the distribution channels. And it, has, it had immediate effects on how we could deal with the crisis. This global gap between where the protective materials were made and where they were needed made us less resilient. To close the gaps in our resilience, we need competent people People who want to rise to the occasion, who are motivated, who see the urgency. And that's exactly what we saw during the COVID crisis. General practitioners and uh, community organizations and some other people started working together and they set up monitoring systems, they set up um, communication channels to communities that are hard to reach. 
they went to try to do contact tracing. And it's a good example of how in times of uncertainty, when in fact at national or federal Flemish city level, there was not much direction yet, that still people do things. Such a reaction is only possible if the population has built up enough capacity to act and be flexible. It pushed us into almost a, a war economy. It's suddenly you saw that you close down all streets and all shops and, I don't know, factories that used to make, I don't know what, started now suddenly inventing uh, respirators for hospitals. So this kind of massive mental shift, mental model shift happened and that created, I think again, the conditions for that kind of innovation and emergence. When healthcare collapses, people and resilient healthcare workers are capital. Practitioners had to kind of be very, let's say, brave, you know. They, they do things they were not trained to do, you see. We hear ITM researcher and pharmacist Saleh al Jadea, who we met in previous episodes and who experienced this firsthand during the war in Syria. I remember a colleague was telling me that they were involved in, in certain surgeries. They were not trained to do that, but they were t- told, OK, you are still better than a pharmacist. You know, you are still better, I mean, better, you are more qualified to do that than a lab technician. Medical students also stepped in to do their part. Due to the conflict also, many people, many uh, medical students could not finish their uh, training. Uh, but still they were very much involved in, in, in providing health care. Although per law they were not qualified to do that. But still, again, they were told, OK, you are still uh, more qualified than an, an electrician or an al- architect. Working in the midst of a crisis for five years, they acquired a unique skill set in dealing with emergencies and complex wounds, all with very limited resources. So that's a very unique, I would say, very unique qualification that practitioners could acquire there. Healthcare providers deserve more respect for what they do, agrees Lenka Benyova, Professor of Reproductive and Maternal Health at ITM. Only when they get the right support and respect will they continue to function in a crisis situation. They are the software of all that is health system, and we often forget, neglect their experience, their lived realities, and the way that they are asking to be supported in order to do their job well. To better prepare for future crises, Lenka and her team wanted to understand how women's caregivers, and more specifically, midwives, coped with the pressure during the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And what the midwives were saying about what was happening around them and in their professional lives was incredible. In Belgium, midwives come to the home to support the mother in and after childbirth and to make sure everything is going well. When COVID arrived, everyone wanted gear to protect themselves. Gloves, aprons, masks. And guess what? Midwives, whose job it was to visit women at home postnatally, were not prioritized for face masks. They were not considered among the list of essential workers. I mean, how much more essential does it get? How much more essential are, can you be than looking after babies who are days old and, and women who have just come home? Because we are so focused on populations, on patients, children, immunizations, supplies and equipment and money and money and money that we often forget to talk about healthcare workers other than in a way that blames or shames or names. Even in the hospitals themselves, where everyone was seeing their work environment change dramatically, midwives were not asked for their opinions. And so, for example, one of the f- first rules that was implemented is a ban on visitors. No visitors, no family, and often no accompanying person, and banning birth companions, banning visitors. Uh, for women who might have been hospitalized for weeks with some kind of complications, women with premature babies in the hospital, was so against everything that midwives know about how to do their job well that they actually went against the system. So the clinicians, the doctors, the managers imposed a ban on visitors. The midwives found a way 
to smuggle husbands into the kitchen to have five minutes with their wives once in a few weeks. To an outsider, even during a crisis, everything may seem to run smoothly. There are doctors, there are midwives, women give birth, women are discharged. But when you scratch the surface through a disruption like COVID, you see that midwives who are the frontline providers of respectful, normal, woman-centered care have very little voice in how systems, procedures, protocols, and clinical care is delivered. And that is not right. You would hope we learn from the experience that it won't happen again. But lessons are hard to learn. We are sick and tired of hearing about COVID to the extent that not even the lessons that had presented themselves on a golden platter are staying with us anymore because there is another priority, another thing to do, another policy to implement. Overall, the Belgian system has the capacity to respond to crises. Yeah, we were quite pessimistic about, about that, but we, the, fa- some of the facts have proven us wrong. In fact, it is possible and it happens. But in Belgium, it's easy to talk. If you have 10 general practitioners in a small community, some of them can take some additional measures and initiatives. Compare that with countries where one doctor is responsible for an area of 100 square kilometers. Under those circumstances, you understand why new initiatives and responses to disasters are harder to start. Yet people do succeed, and the global north can learn a great deal from the global south. Thailand has been exposed to a number of shocks over the last 15 years, um, from very severe political crisis to migration influxes from uh, from Myanmar to floodings and, and the tsunami, for example, to COVID-19. ITM is now working with local partners from the Chiang Mai University to examine how Thailand has coped with this diverse set of disasters, how they learn from them and how they are preparing for the next one. The key question is... One shock, the next one comes, what happens in between? How do they transform from one situation to the next? Responding to a disaster like a tsunami may involve traditional measures such as improving warning systems and building higher dikes. But addressing fundamental issues such as reforming the insurance sector to speed up financial assistance strengthens the ability of the entire system to respond to any crisis. Similar principles apply in other parts of the world, where interventions against flood risks can range from building dikes to educating people, with each level of intervention providing a stronger foundation, a better resilience than the one before. And we might say that everyone is different and that Thailand is not the same as any other country, and that's true. But cities are cities. We know that cities have properties. There are not 25,000 ways in which cities have evolved. There are patterns. So we look for the patterns. Looking for patterns and learning from each other is something we need to do much more if we want to prepare for crises. As Lenka Benyova points out. If we listen to each other, if we could say, hey, friends in Guinea, you've had an epidemic of Ebola. How did you figure out how to be able to take care of pregnant women at the same time where you had to minimize exposure of everyone to everyone else? But do you think we did that? I have yet to hear one policymaker or decision maker from a high income country who consciously calls people in low resource settings who have much more experience with this and health systems sort of resilient with different shocks to ask for help or advice. For that reason, ITM is participating in a study in Bamako, Mali, where a very resilient group of internally displaced people had to learn to cope with extreme changes as war, drought and climate change pushed them across the country. Still, they somehow find ways to survive. Hoping to learn from their stories, ITM researcher Husinatu Si went to her home country of Mali to talk to them and to study how this group of people tackles challenges. How do they remain resilient under these circumstances? It's an important question that the world can learn a lot from. And coming from Mali herself, she could read that situation much better than an outsider ever could. Something that Saleh al Jadea, as a Syrian himself, also experienced when he did research with Syrian refugees in Germany. I mean, refugees in the literature, in the research, or migrants are often described as a hard-to-reach group, you know. So when I I started planning my PhD, this term had kind of a discouraging 
effect, you see. Even like when I was interviewed by a funder, they were like, okay, are you aware that you are going into that kind of very difficult situation? Sally planned to do a survey about health, intimate details, feelings. The expectation was that the group of refugees would turn away from Sally and his survey wouldn't work. But Sally persisted. And what did he find? Syrian refugees were not a difficult group at all. I had really great time. I was like, I mean, most of the patients were very open. They were actually very excited to talk about the issues they face. They say, oh, finally somebody is asking us, how are you doing, you see? So actually, I've, I've seen it the opposite. I, I found them more accessible. And I was asking myself, if I have done a study with elderly uh, population, I mean, this is a population I never worked with, I think I might have much more difficult time. When you're an outsider, it's much harder to help people become more resilient to shocks and crises. Is it even possible? How do you know what will work if you don't fully understand the culture? Prashant Srinivas, who we already met in episodes one and two of this season, and who works with an ethnic community in the forests of southern India, knows all about the struggle. I think for me the biggest challenge is, um, is uh, that most people working with indigenous communities are not themselves um, um, indigenous people. So there aren't enough indigenous people who have um, been able to receive the kind of training uh, in any discipline. Huh? So that's that's really at the heart of the challenge. That's the reason why there has always been others who have had to speak in on behalf of uh, these communities. If you always have to rely on outside people to find solutions for you, that quickly becomes problematic on many levels. Research has always then become something that others do and I have to participate in it. I give data and other English-speaking uh, educated people come and, and that has to change. That's not how you build resilience. That's not how you create people who can handle a crisis. For resilience and for dignity, public health has to put people at the heart. Knowing that we can't prepare for everything, we have to build resilience to handle the crises of tomorrow. And we have to learn from each other, from people who already lived the experience. Give people the chance to learn and do it with respect. The newspaper is full of problems, priorities, disasters and party politics. It's easy to lump them all together and decide that the challenge is too big to fight. Saleh experiences this every day. I find it quite striking that people, they ask me, what, what is your research on? I say on access to medicines in conflict zones, I focus on northern Syria. So many people react, oh, is there still conflict in northern Syria? The conflict in northern Syria has been going on for many years and has become chronic. People no longer see chronic conflicts as a disaster or an emergency. It isn't news anymore. If there, there is a bomb now in northern Syria, what is new about this, you see? This will become the case if, if hopefully not the conflict would, would go on in Ukraine. At some point, we normalize conflict and human suffering in these regions. And that has a tremendous impact on healthcare. And this should not be the case. I don't know how can we be aware, raise awareness about the human suffering in these settings. Uh, but but what I see that these countries get off the radar, you know. Uh, so this is quite challenging. I think it's quite challenging for also researchers who want to convince funders to look at these settings. Never normalize a crisis. Never give up. We need to keep our eyes on the never-ending quest for a healthier world for everyone. Or as Lenka would say, wake up angry every day. Yeah, you get exasperated at times, but I think the it's a positive kind of anger. It's the anger that drives you to do your best. It's not every day a frustrated anger. <laughs> think about the black box we opened in the first episode of this season. It was a box that contained the whole system needed to keep us healthy. It contained plans, strategies, people and buildings. 
Looking at it from the outside, the system hums on a daily basis and seems sturdy. But the researchers at ITM look at the system with curiosity. They want to understand how it works, how to make it work better, and how to make sure it doesn't collapse at the first disaster. I think we should remember that access to health care is a basic human right. You know, so this this is not a luxury. This should not be a case to put pressure on population. Nobody should suffer uh, because of lacking access medicine to medicines due to political decision, you see. This is immoral. So ITM researchers keep on exploring. Together with their partners, they know that our healthcare systems cannot be taken for granted. And we hope that now you know this as well. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed these episodes, make sure to check out the first season of Transmission, devoted to outbreaks. From early encounters with Ebola in distant villages to the recent fight against COVID-19 in bustling urban settings, the four episodes of the season tell tales of resilience, discovery and humanity under the most challenging circumstances imaginable. And stick around for the third season, where we'll look at disease elimination. Because wouldn't the world be a better place if we just got rid of all those diseases? For more information about the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, visit itg.be slash podcast.